This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. That is a great Bible verse from Psalm 118. But it's not just something we quote by rote. It's something we do here at First Baptist each and every Sunday. There is something special about gathering with fellow believers and rejoicing together in the Lord. Before we do that, take a few minutes to look at these upcoming events. We are thrilled to announce our very first Foundry event, the Foundry Worship and Prayer Night. The Foundry is our ministry for young families. Our desire is to help forge marriages and families here at FBP. Mark your calendars for Friday, September 20th, as we gather together at 6 p.m. in our chapel for an evening of worship and prayer led by our very own Chris Choir. Young families, join us for this special night dedicated to coming together in prayer for our school year, our teachers, our community, and our families. Bring your kids with you to worship, and then afterwards, we invite you to stick around in our commons area for some fantastic food and fun games. Don't miss out on this exciting opportunity to connect, worship, and enjoy time together as a church community. Join us, and let's make this a night to remember. See you there. Our First Care Ministry is dedicated to helping and supporting people who are going through challenging times. GriefShare is a support ministry for those grieving the loss of someone close to them. GriefShare will meet on Sundays at 5 p.m. in W104 beginning August 18th. Divorce Care is for those adults dealing with pain and hurt from a separation or divorce. Divorce Care will meet on Tuesdays beginning August 20th at 6.30 p.m. For more information on these First Care Ministries, contact us at caring at fbp.org or by visiting www.fbp.org forward slash first care. We're excited to share that The Collective is going back to Japan in June of 2025 for a mission trip to the largest city in the world, Tokyo. Jesus commanded us to go to the ends of the earth and Japan is less than 1% Christian. This trip is a wonderful opportunity for us to share the message of Jesus Christ with people who have never heard of him. For all details, including general information about the trip and dates for our interest meetings, visit our church website at fup.org slash Japan. Join us in this important mission to make a difference and spread Christ's love. We look forward to seeing you at one of these interest meetings and on this incredible journey. Men of FPP, join us Saturday morning, August 31st at 8.30 a.m. in the Fellowship Center for breakfast. Start your weekend with a delicious hot meal, encouraging fellowship with other brothers in Christ, and an inspirational word from Kurt Williams, founder of Youth Reach Houston. Get your tickets online at fbp.org forward slash men or at the church office during the week for only $5. Don't hit the snooze button and miss our FBP men's breakfast. How many of you grew up like I did, not rich? Don't be so happy about it. We borrowed for everything. Want a new couch? Go finance it. Want a new TV? Go finance it. We were just doing what was normal. People change their lives when they get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And they finally say, that's it, I've had it! This is a wealth building plan. It's not just a get out of debt plan. A budget is simply a plan for your money. You deal with the money stuff, and all of a sudden, you find freedom and connection everywhere. I feel like I can do more things than I ever could. You can go from where you are to where you want to be. You're free. You just gotta get started. We have many exciting things coming up. Be sure and check out our FBP app for more information on these events and other things happening around FBP. Thank you for joining us today as we rejoice together, as we worship together, and as we hear God's Word.
I just really wish the congregation could see your facial expressions when you're leading this choir. It's probably better not. <laughs> you would be afraid not to sing. I'm watching him. Man alive. Well, listen, thank you for being in the house of the Lord this morning. If you're one of our guests, we're thrilled that you're here. If you're watching online, we're glad about that. And uh, we want you to be part of the worship service as well and easy to let us know. We really want to know. It encourages us. It's kind of your encouragement to us that work at the church. Let us know. Easy way to do that is tap that little number on the screen, then the word connect. And then you can give out a little information in probably a minute and a half, two minutes max. If you have a need or a prayer need, let us know about that. But members, let's give our guests a hand. Can we do that? Welcome them. Now, if you'll open your bulletin up to the inside, I mentioned last Sunday, if you look at the little section, it says, coming up, we have some things beginning today. We have precept upon precept. We have men of the king. Then over to the right of that, grief share starts today, and uh, then divorce care is Tuesday. So this week cranks up a lot of things. Now, the details are in the bulletin. You don't need me to read those to you, but I'm excited about all the things cranking back up and looking forward to what God is going to do. Well, I asked Jimmy Hurrick if he would. Jimmy, if you'll come. I asked Jimmy, they heard Dottie share her tithing testimony, and then they heard me, and today they're going to get to hear you in a couple of weeks. I've not asked her, but I'm going to ask Lynn to share hers. We're just going to kind of check around here. How did you become a tither? Well, Pastor, I, of course, I grew up in church. We went to First Baptist Church in Carrollton, moved down there when I was in the fifth grade, and they taught tithing. I really didn't think anything about it. But as I ended up in college and then seminary, there was a revival in our seminary that just really cemented my ideas about tithing. And the preacher that week was John Bassanio oh, yeah. from First Baptist Houston. Oh, he man. preached all week. And I missed the one sermon where he had 17 points. But his sermon about tithing centered on that verse, Luke 638, give and it will be given unto you. And it just, he really challenged us to participate in tithing and see what God would do. And it's just been an incredible journey. In our marriage at the beginning, I mean, there was no money at all. I was working part-time. Lynn was working at a little plumbing supply place, and there just wasn't anything. And I remember one day, one week, we had a $75 phone bill. I can't remember why it was so big. That was pretty big back then. But we came home from church one day. There was an envelope on our porch with $76 in it. Incredible. When Hannah was small, she had to have real expensive surgery. We had to pay our out-of-pocket expense for our insurance. It was like $2,000, seems like. And God met that need in a totally unexpected way through one person who gave that money to, to meet that need that year. And that's just been testimony after testimony after testimony our whole life up until even this week, how God has met needs because we answered his call, put out by John Bassanio, to be a tither. Well, now, see, that's it. So it's in seminary. This is yep. Brother John preaching. Now, Big see, Brother John. Dottie, Dottie's daddy taught her as a little girl. My wife taught me. We, we had to get you in seminary to teach you time. That's right. That's right. <laughs> people, you can see why our church is in such a mess. We've got people. <laughs> that was a long time ago, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what. Well, anyway, th Jimmy, thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. You know, it's just interesting. They didn't clap over my testimony. I don't understand it. But uh, it, it, it is interesting how different people learn to tithe in different timing. Now, I can't wait. I, I do. I really should have checked out this, but I am going to ask Lynn one Sunday soon. Be interested how, uh, how she learned to tithe. And, and, you know, be interested how you learned to tithe. In fact, I wish some of you would send me a little email and just say, hey, here's how I learned to tithe. It would be very, very interesting to see the different ways that God works at different times in people's lives. Well, I want us to bow and have prayer. Father, we bless you and thank you so much. It's interesting. When he mentioned John Bassanio, God, he was such a dear friend of myself and this church. And uh, God, you use that dear brother and to, to, to bless a lot of people. And what a difference he made. And God, I just thank you that the Holy Spirit in different ways uses different people, different times, different things to teach us. Help us to be sensitive to what you're saying. But I thank you this morning. I thank you this morning for the opportunity, God, to worship you. I thank you for what you did in this room last Sunday. 
I pray, God, today we're going to see what you can do and give you the glory in it. Bless our gifts. Bless every giver, God. Help us be faithful in our giving. That's one thing, God, all of us can do. Now, we can do a lot of other things the same, and then there's some things some of us can do and others can do, and that's how the body of Christ works. But when it comes to giving, that's one thing we can join together and do and make a difference in kingdom work. And we thank you so much in Jesus' name. Amen. tell how he's been faithful and he's never failed they might sound different but they're all the same a testimony of amazing grace so we
His blood was the payment, His life was the cost. We stood beneath the death we could never afford. Our sins and our many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more. mercy and your grace because it truly is so much more so much more than the sins that we have which are great and we praise you for that and we pray this morning God as we think about one life that we would commit our one life to live for you and God as John challenges us this morning let that be our commitment even before the sermon begins. Our answer is yes. We will be that one life that goes out and shares you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jimmy. Let's give our choir and orchestra a hand today for leading us in great worship. And thank you for being here. Now, I have a special recognition, a recognition that I want to make. We have a special couple in our church who this Wednesday will be celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Now, I don't know where Charles and Dottie Redmond are seated, but would you please stand so we can recognize you? <laughs> now, as I said, it's Wednesday, so my mom has to stay with him until at least then, okay, for it to be 60 years. But it is hard to believe that you guys have been married for that long. I'm glad that you were. I wouldn't be here if you had not been married. And uh, so, happy anniversary, and we just hope this is your best year yet. Could we give them another hand? You see these beautiful altar flowers here? I told them that I wanted to buy those, and then I saw the bill for these flowers, and I said, that foreign currency needs to revalue that I mentioned last week for me to pay for that. But anyway, special, special day, special week for them and for our family. Happy, happy anniversary. Now, the title of the sermon this morning is Calling Out the Called. The intent and the intention of this sermon is to call out, now I want you to think about this for just a moment, to call out those whom God has called into full-time Christian ministry. There are some today in this service and the next and some who are watching in other places who are sensing God's call in their life. And there may well be some, even in this room right now, whom God is calling to be pastors, preachers, evangelists, missionaries, worship leaders, student ministers, children's ministers, college ministers, to work at a church in some way, or perhaps to embark on a career in Christian education. My dad and I were talking on Friday afternoon at the end of the day, and I said to him, Dad, had you and Mom not answered God's call into the ministry, you would not be celebrating your 60th wedding anniversary in Pasadena, Texas. You would be celebrating in Atlanta, Georgia, because that's where you were when God called you. And yet, God's call did for them what God's call does for everyone. It changes everything about your life. Again, the title of the message is Calling Out the Called. Now, I do fully understand that as Christians, whatever our vocation may be, God has called us to ministry 
to a life of ministry. In fact, originally today, my plan, I had invited one of my good friends who is a doctor in the medical center. He and I went through college together. He has done surgery on me. He's a wonderful Christian man. And I said, would you be willing to come to First Baptist one Sunday and as part of the sermon, let me interview you on how even as a medical doctor, you can and you are a minister. Not only are you a physician, but you are a minister for Christ in that setting to try to make the point that no matter what our job is, we still are ministers in that setting. And he agreed to come and then was unable to come because he and his wife are taking their kids to college this weekend. It's that time of year, and so maybe we can schedule him for later on. And it would have been a good interview and very interesting, but I think we all understand that anyway, that no matter what our job is, we are supposed to minister. We are uh, called by God to be ministers, and yet today I'm making a distinction, since we're always so big on emphasizing that point, I'm making a distinction today that we don't make as much, and that is there is a difference between doing ministry and being in the, quote, ministry, full-time Christian ministry. Now, I know what you're already thinking. Many of you probably are thinking, well, this is an interesting sermon. Maybe you should preach this on Wednesday night to the students while they're trying to decide what they're going to do in their life, or maybe to our college group, or really, John, maybe this sermon would be better at breaking free or maybe even the 11 o'clock service when the students will be there. But you're preaching a sermon today, calling out the call, talking about embarking on a life of full-time vocational ministry. And some are thinking, John, now wait, back then when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years of age, when when me and all my friends were were making our plans for the future, when we were making our decisions for what we were going to do with our life, I never felt thought about being in the ministry. I never considered that. I never felt God leading me into the ministry. All right, that's fine. I don't question that. But today, I'm not asking you what you felt 30 years ago or more. I'm asking you this. Could it be that God is calling you into full-time Christian ministry now? You say, no, John, now? 30 years after the decision was made on what I was going to do in my career, you say, John, now I'm established in my career. I'm established in my job. I have a family. I have financial obligations. And there's no way that God would call me now to leave all of that and to potentially go to seminary or to prepare in some other way, if not through the seminary, there's no way that God would call me into the ministry now. Because God, you're thinking, doesn't call people into the ministry later on in life after they are established in a career. And my response to that would be, really? Really? Open your Bible, if you would, to Matthew chapter 4. I want to show you quickly five people whom God called into the ministry after they were well established in their career. In Matthew chapter 4, we read about the first four of these. They were very established as fishermen. Now, Jesus was about 30 years of age when he began his ministry. And the impression we get is that his disciples were about the same age as he was. And so these disciples, some may have been older, some may have been younger, but they were in that same age, but the age doesn't matter. God can call you at any age. In chapter 4 of Matthew, look in verse 18, and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. They had a job. They had a career. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Now that 20th verse only has a few words, but it's, it's very significant what is being said there. They left their nets. They walked away from their job, from their source of income, from their careers to follow Jesus, not knowing where their financial provision would come from. In verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat. Now, watch this. These two guys not only left their careers, 
but they left their father and followed Jesus. And so they were established not only in a business, they were established in the family business. And yet when Christ called them, they left that business, they left that career, and they even left their father to follow Jesus. And so for a person to say, well, God would never call me now. I'm, I'm too established in my career. These men were very established in their career, and God's call came in their direction. Now turn to chapter 9 of Matthew. And in verse number 9, we read about another man. This man was Matthew. Some of your translations may say Levi. It's the same person. He was a tax collector. He was very established in his job. He, he had a good source of income. And in Matthew 9, verse 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office, and he said, follow me. That's all Jesus said, follow me. He called him. He didn't tell him where he was going. He didn't tell him how he was going to be able to pay his bills. He didn't tell him. He just said, follow me. So Matthew arose and followed Jesus. Yes, he did. But when he followed Jesus, he left his job. He left his career. Now, some are thinking, now, wait a second, John. God, I, I, don't, I, I see what he did with these men, but, but I don't know that God would do that in my case. I, because if God called me into the ministry, into the ministry, the full-time vocational ministry, that might mean that I would have to move. That might mean that I would have to leave my home and my family and that I would have to leave my comfort zone and, and it might mean that I would have to move. And some are thinking, at this stage in my life, God would never call on me to move. And to that, I say, really? Because God did that in the Bible. You don't have to turn there, but let me just read you a, a verse in Genesis chapter 12 and in verse number 1. Notice what it says. The Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Look in verse, or listen to verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot, that is his nephew, went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. He wasn't 30. He was 75. And it would have been easy for Abram to have said, now, God, wait a second. I've got family here. I've got roots here. Everything that means anything to me is here. And not only that, I'm 75 years of age, and you are calling me to leave all of this to follow you? And God would have said, yes, I am. And that's what Abraham did. He stepped out. And in Hebrews, we read that Abraham followed God. He obeyed God. Then it has this phrase, not knowing where he was going. He had no idea where he was going or how his needs would be met. And so to say, God would not call me because it might mean that I have to move. And God would not expect that of me. Well, God might expect. How, how do you get a pass? I mean, how, how are you not potentially, I'm not saying that God is calling you to do this, but how are you not potentially expected as a child of God to do what other of his, others of his children have done? I can remember when I was in seminary from 1992 to 1995 at Southwestern. When I began my first year there, I was 22 years old. And I met in some of my earlier classes a man named Gene Lanier. Gene and his wife Sue had both moved to Fort Worth to go to seminary, and Gene was, and, and Sue, they were in their late 40s or early 50s. He had had a successful career. They lived in South Carolina. If I may be mistaken on this part of my memory, it's been a long time, but I think they ran a bed and breakfast in the part of South Carolina where they lived, and they were just living a really good life. He'd already made the money that he needed, and now he had a bed and breakfast. And, and about this season of their life, they felt like God was calling them into the ministry to be missionaries to a place called Curacao in the Caribbean. That was what was on their heart. And so they sold their business, or at least they left their business. They left their home. Their kids were raised by this time. They were already grown, but they left them, and they moved to Fort Worth, and for three years, attended Southwestern Seminary. We all graduated on the same day in May of 1995. And Gene and Sue went on to be missionaries in Curacao for seven 
years. And it, I was always so blessed, and I just always thought about the sacrifice that they were making compared to the sacrifice I was making. I felt like their sacrifice was much greater. I was much younger. I was just starting. They paid a real price to do what they did. God called them, and they moved. And so for you to say, well, God would never call me into the ministry like that because I might have to move, you, you, that's, that's not biblical. That's not right. Now, some would take that one step further, and they would say, John, here's the deal when it comes to serving God and being a minister. In my mind, and you might not say it this way, but, but this is how some people live their lives. In my mind, I have drawn a circle of about 30, a 30-mile 30 radius around this church. And I will do anything within this radius that God wants me to do. I'll teach Sunday school. I'll sing in the choir. I'll, I'll do anything. But it's going to have to be within this 30-mile radius. Well, how many of us know you can't draw a 30-mile radius around your life and say, God, do anything you want to do with me in that circle? We can't tell God what to do, and we, still, we certainly can't tell God where to use us or where we're available to him. I, I read years ago when Rick Warren, the founding pastor of Saddleback, who went on to have one of the most amazing ministries in all of American history, in fact, in all of world history, in Christian history. When he was coming to the end of his seminary time in Fort Worth, he was already married, and one night he and his wife Kay in the little apartment that they lived in, they got out a map of the world, and they just spread the map out on their floor in their apartment. And they got down on their knees, and they said, God, there's a map of the whole world. And Rick said to God, he said, God, our preference is to be career missionaries in Japan. But that may not be your will for our lives. And so, God, there's the world. And we're saying to you, we are available to go anywhere on that map that you would send us. And after praying that prayer through an amazing series of events, God led them to Southern California to start Saddleback Church and the rest is history from there. But I never have forgotten that image of the two of them in their early 20s spreading out a map and saying, God, we will go anywhere you tell us to go. We are available. And that leads us to our, back to our sermon emphasis this morning, Only One Life. That's the name of a poem written by C.T. Studd, and I read much of that poem last week. In fact, when you go out today at both welcome centers, we have printed up 2,000 copies of the poem that I read from last week, and I hope you'll get one of those today and maybe some to, to give to friends. But here's the line that continues to reappear throughout the entire poem. Let's just say it together. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Now, say it by yourself without me helping you. Let's just go. Say it. Only what's done for Christ will last. And so I want to make some observations today about God's call. It's interesting. It's probably more information than you want, than you want to know, but I, I prepare, I begin my sermons on Monday. I devote my entire day Monday to editing booklets and working on sermons. And my goal on Monday is to never leave my house, to just start that and just do it till late at night on Monday. And by 10, 11 o'clock, to have an outline ready, and then I can think about the sermon all week, and then either on Friday or Saturday, come back to the sermon and write it out. And that's my practice. And so on Monday, I did that, and by late Monday night, I had the outline ready to go. And last night, I sat down in my study at home to write the sermon. And when I got into the sermon, I thought, this is, this is, this is too much for one sermon. Now, I know some of you think I have a lot of sermons that are, have too much for one sermon. But I, this is too much. And so if you have an outline today, you notice I have four points, and in the, on the third point, I have three subpoints. Now, those three subpoints will be the sermon for next week. I'm not going to do that today. But I want to just walk through and give you today some observations about God's call. If we, all that I'm really giving you before that was I was going to fly through that to get to those three subpoints, and we we're going to be rooted in one particular text. As it is now, we're kind of looking at, at different scriptures and different texts. But I want to make some observations about God's call because as you're thinking, well, you know, John, maybe God is calling me into full-time Christian service or, or part-time Christian service, but something in addition to what I'm currently doing. And so I would begin by saying this. The call of God is personal, 
You may be wondering, how will I know if God has called me into the ministry or not? Well, it's a personal call. The same way you knew that God was calling you to be saved. Same thing. Same thing. In that same way, you'll just know God is speaking and God is calling me into the ministry. If you're here today and you're saved, you may not remember all the details of your conversion experience. And that's okay. You don't have to. But I, I can almost guarantee you, you will remember the conviction of the Holy Spirit when he called you and let you know as a child or as an adult that it was time for you to be saved. Now, let me give you a verse to write down in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5, verses 4 and 5. Here we read about the call of Jeremiah. The Bible says, the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah says this, saying, now here's, here's God speaking to Jeremiah. Jeremiah's a grown man now. And God is speaking to him. And God said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. In the day in which we live, the question is, when does life begin? And those who believe in abortion say life begins at birth. Those of us who are against abortion say life begins at conception. Well, we're closer to right than, than the other side is. But we're not all the way right there. God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, Life begins in the mind of God before conception takes place. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. God is saying to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, before your parents came together, I already knew you. And not only did I know you, I already had a plan for your life. And I had ordained you to be a prophet to the nations. I had already called you to be in the ministry before your parents ever met. And not only that, I had sanctified you so that you could be a faithful and a clean vessel of mine. It is a personal call. And Jeremiah must have heard that and thought, before you formed me in the womb. Before my parents came together, before I was conceived, you already knew me. The call of God is personal. I thought last week about all those in the Bible whom God gave a personal calling to. This list is not exhaustive, but it's a good list. God called Abraham. God called Moses. God called Samuel. God called Isaiah. And then on that Damascus road, God called Saul of Tarsus. And I'm saying to you, if God is calling you into the ministry, he will make it so clear to you, just like you knew you needed to be saved, you'll know that that's what God wants you to do. But not only is the call of God uh, personal, the call of God is persistent. Now, turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 3. I want you to see this, this, this passage because it's an extended passage. In 1 Samuel chapter number 3, we read about the call of Samuel. And I want to just read these first few verses. Are you finding it? I'm not hearing your pages turn like you did a minute ago. W wake the person up next to you. Say, the sermon's not over yet. 1 Samuel chapter 3. I want to begin reading in verse 1. Now, Samuel here is a little boy. He's a young fellow. And yet God's call was on his life. And God now is beginning to call him in verse number 1. Now, the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Eli was the priest. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. I'm afraid the word of the Lord is rare in these days. Certainly it was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. And it came to pass at that time, while Eli was lying down in his place, and when his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see, Eli was an old man. His vision was failing him. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, where the ark of God was, that Samuel was lying down. And the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. And Eli said, I did not call you. Go lie down again. And he went and he lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He answered, I did not call you, my son. Lie down again. God is calling Samuel. And Samuel thinks it's Eli that's, who's calling him. Verse 7, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. Samuel wasn't even saved yet, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. And so God now is placing a calling on Samuel's life before Samuel even knows the Lord. In verse 8, the Lord called Samuel again the third time. What is the point I'm making? The call of God is persistent. It just keeps coming. It just keeps coming. 
It just keeps coming. And if God is calling you, that call will just keep coming. When you get in bed at night and everybody else in the house is asleep and there it is, you alone with God in your thoughts and you're looking up at the ceiling, the call of God just keeps coming. And you're trying to run from it and do something else, but it just keeps coming. And you wake up in the morning and it keeps coming. And you come to church today and it just keeps coming. And now a whole sermon on the call of God, it's just coming and it's persistent like that. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli and said, here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called Samuel as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered. Now he knew it was God. Speak, for your servant hears. Your servant is listening. And so the call of God came to Samuel with persistence. It just kept coming, and it just kept coming, and it just kept coming. And it got clearer as it went. And God used Eli to help clarify the call on Samuel's life. And God uses people in our lives to help us to to clarify the call. I remember when I was a teenager, and I began to think God might. In fact, I think I had thought that long before I was a teenager. But it got stronger and more persistent. And I felt like God was calling me into the ministry. And I shared that with my dad. And my dad said to me, he said, well, now, John, we have to be very careful about this because you've always looked up to me. And you respect what I do. But you can't become a minister, a preacher, just because I'm a preacher. You have to have your own call. And we talked about that. And he helped me with that. And we would talk again. And he said, now, think about this call to the ministry. If you could be happy doing anything else besides preaching, do that. I thought he was trying to talk me out of it. And he kind of was. Because he was trying to help me to understand this is not something you just do on the spur of the moment without having thought it through and prayed it through. But as we weren't through that process, it became obvious to me and and to him and, and, and to others that God was calling me. And here God used Eli to help clarify that call. So the call of God is persistent. Not only that, and this is what I want to develop more next week, the call of God can be painful. Sometimes God calls us to do some of the things I have mentioned, to quit a job, to, to leave your home, to leave your family, to leave your city, to go outside of that 30-mile radius like he did with Gene and Sue Lanier. And that can be a very difficult thing, and that can be a very painful thing. And we'll talk about that more next week. But to the, the next point is, the call of God is peaceful. It can be painful, but it's always peaceful. There's a peace that this is it. If God is calling you into the ministry, you, you may wonder or question or talk to people or try to figure it out, but there will come a point in your life where you will just say, this is it. I'm in my sweet spot. I'm doing exactly what God has called me to do. Now, you know me well enough to know that it, from my testimony, it took me a long time to come to the full assurance of my salvation. I really struggled with that. Thank God I finally got there 20 years ago. But it took a long time to get there. That being true, I have never doubted my call to preach for five seconds. Now, that's interesting. I've never doubted that. I've never wondered that. I have always known that. I I knew it as a, I thought about it as a child. I knew it as a teenager. I, I, I just know this is what God has called me to do. And I love doing what I'm doing. I wrote this in my notes last night. I, I honestly believe that I've got the greatest life and the greatest job in the whole world. And I wouldn't trade places with anybody in the world. I was thinking about that. Is there anybody in this world that I would trade places? I wouldn't trade places with anybody. I just love what God has called me to do. I feel like I'm in my sweet spot. I'm in my anointing. And that gets back to the statement, if you can do anything else besides be in the ministry and be happy, then God is not calling you into the ministry. If God is calling you into the ministry, you would be miserable doing anything else. But if he's calling you, you would be so thrilled, so fulfilled, so happy, so confident, so assured that this is the way that God wants me to walk. This is what God wants me to do with my life. doesn't mean that it's always easy. doesn't mean there aren't challenges or some even bad days. No. And it doesn't mean that we don't have an enemy. 
who tries to discourage us and sometimes who even tries to bump us out of what God has called us to do. But we stay with God and we say, God, how do I navigate through this? And God helps us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 16, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Paul had a calling on his life. That calling cost him his life. He ended up being beheaded by Nero in Rome. But even before that, he's paying the price. He's stoned in Lystra. He's beaten. He's imprisoned. I mean, all the things that Paul went through, he's shipwrecked. But it was not an easy calling. And he had the enemy fighting against him. But in the midst of all that, Paul says, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And in that same letter to the Corinthians, in that first letter to the Corinthians, he said in the 16th chapter and down in the 9th verse, he said, A great and effective door has opened to me. There's a door Paul had there in Ephesus where he wrote this letter from. There's a door, an effective door for me to share the gospel. And yet he said, there are many adversaries. Yeah, there were people trying to bump him off. There were circumstances that threatened him. The devil trying to intimidate him and discourage him. But Paul said, I can't quit. I can't stop. I can't do anything else. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. And if God has a calling on your life, you'll say that with Paul. Woe is me. I would be miserable if I don't do what God has called me to do. A passion. It's peaceful. But not only is it peaceful, there's this passion. You just have, you just say, this is what God has called me to do. Now, you still listen? Say amen. amen. I'm in the process of trying to figure out if I need to buy a particular piece of furniture for my house. I don't know what to do. And so I have been online. I've looked at this piece of furniture from different stores. Yesterday, I called a couple of department stores who sell furniture and I was asking them, do you have this? This company said, no, we don't sell that. We sell something similar, but not that. Another company, I never could get them on the phone. I just got on the, uh, call, you know, the, wait, the answering machine. If you want this, press one. If you want this, press two. If you want this, press three. So I just pressed end call right after, <laughs> after waiting for a while. They couldn't get anybody to answer. I thought, well, you know what I need to do is call gallery furniture, right? I mean, that's an establishment here in Houston. And I know they have it. I had seen it on their website. And so I called Gallery Furniture to ask about this piece of furniture and if I might could get that if they had it. So I called. Phone rang. After about a ring or two, somebody picked it up. And here's what I heard on the other end of the call. This is Mac. <laughs> this is Mac. I thought it was a recording. I thought it was a recording. So I was kind of quiet. He said, this is Mac. Can I help you? I said, this is Mattress Mac? This is the real Mattress Mac? He said, this is me. Well, hey, I'm glad you called. How can I help you today? What would you like to buy? And I was so nervous. I said, I can't remember what I wanted to buy. <laughs> I thought, I'm on the phone with Mattress Mac. I had met him one time years ago. I didn't even tell him this yesterday. But, but uh, he would have remembered the person I was with. He would not have remembered me. But I said, well, I'm thinking about buying this piece of furniture. I said, I, I said but I... I just can't believe that you're answering the call. It's Saturday afternoon, and you're taking calls? You own the company. He's, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm here to help you in, in, in any way I can. And we talked for a while, and at the end, he said, you know, you, you could just order one of these pieces of furniture, but really the best thing for you to do would just be to come out here and look at it, and you can, you'd, make a better, you'd make a better decision. And at the end of the call, I said, well, I just want you to know, I can't believe I talked to you today. This is the highlight of my day. And, and, and thanks for all you do for the, uh, for the community. And he said, well, let me tell you something. You know Mattress Mac, high energy, right? He said, if it weren't for customers like you, we couldn't do what we do. Thank you for calling. Have a great day. Man, I hung up. I thought, man. I got, I, yesterday I, I said, I'm going to just do a little research on Mattress Mac on Google. I just Googled some stuff about him. He's 73 years old. Now, I'm not telling you anything private, okay? It's public information. I looked up his net worth yesterday. Now, I don't know if this number is correct or not, but it's, 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 I'm not betraying a confidence, okay? It's out there for the world to see. When you Google Mattress Matt, Max net worth, it is between 300 and $310 million. His foreign currency came in, right? <laughs> it came in. It revalued. I should have bought that instead of what I bought. $310 million. And I'm thinking yesterday, how in the world 
Now, why in the world would a 73-year-old man worth $310 million who could retire, not just go to an island, buy an island <laughs> and a yacht and, and sit under an umbrella and just, and just take it easy for the rest of his life. On a Saturday afternoon in Houston, Texas, why is Mattress Mac answering phone calls behind a desk? Here's the answer for that. Not because he needs the money. Not because he doesn't have something else he could do. He's answering calls on a Saturday afternoon because that is his passion. And I believe that God has led him to do what he's doing just like God has led me to do what I'm doing. And as I was thinking about that, I thought about that all afternoon and I thought about that all night last night. And I wrote this in my notes. We as God called ministers should not be less passionate about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ than Mattress Mac is about selling furniture. We shouldn't be less passionate about that. And I'll take that one step farther. As a minister, I say this to myself first, not at other ministers. I say this to, to, minister, to myself and to all ministers. Any minister who does not have that same passion about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ that Mattress Mac has about selling furniture should do one of two things. First, they should either repent and get revived by God or they should resign their post and let somebody else stand up there who has a passion to do what God's called them to do. You see, one of the ways you know God's called you is you just have a passion. And you say with Paul, woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. Listen, have there been times in my life when it's difficult? Yes, yes, there really have. But I, I would rather do it when it's not easy than not do it at all because God has called me to that. I'm not saying God's necessarily called you to that. But I'm saying God might be. And I'm preaching the entire sermon today calling out the called. I'm trying to help those whom God is calling to recognize that call and then to step out in faith and obey that call and let God lead you where he wants to lead you. Again, back to my parents' anniversary. They're such a beautiful example. 60 years married, almost that long in the ministry, but that long ago feeling God's call. Did they want to leave Atlanta? No. My dad very close to his parents. My mother very close to her parents and to all of our extended family. That's everything they had was in Atlanta. They had never even been to Texas, but they stepped out in faith. And you know, there's a ripple effect to our obedience because they stepped out and did the right thing. It's changed everything about my life and it's changed everything about a lot of people's lives. And it's a beautiful example today that if we'll step out when God calls us, even when it's not easy, that God will honor that and God will bless that. Now, on Monday night, I'm home thinking about this sermon. I knew it was six days away at the time, but I was into it. If y'all would come by my house on Monday night about 10.30, we could do a little preaching then, because I'm, I'm, I'm getting fired up on Monday night about 10.30. And here's what I wrote in my notes, and I want to ask this today as a question to this congregation. This question is aimed at everybody in this room right now, no matter your age or your career. Here's the question. Is there, and don't, don't answer this yet, just, just listen to the question. Is there anybody in this room who thinks that God may be calling them into the ministry? Now, the key words there are may be. Not that he is. And by the way, I'm not suggesting that God's calling anybody into the ministry. I'm just preaching a sermon that God put on my heart. I feel like God said to me, stand up there and preach a sermon entitled, Calling Out the Called. And so here it is. And here's the question. Is there anybody in this room who thinks God may be calling them into the ministry? Because if so, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do something. But before I ask you to do what I'm going to ask you to do, I want to be clear about this. I'm not asking you to commit your life to the full-time ministry here and now. I'm not, that is not what I'm asking you to do. This is not a commitment of your life into the ministry. But I am going to ask you if you think God may be calling you into that in just a moment to say, John, I don't know whether he is or not. 
And I'm not surrendering my life to that because I don't know if that's what God's calling me to do. But I'll be honest, if you could say this honestly, I'll be honest with you, John, I think there's a chance that God may be calling me into the ministry. He may be, he may not be, but he may be. And whether he is or isn't, I'm willing to do it. Now, in a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to, to acknowledge that. Years ago, I heard Louis Giglio. Many of you know Louis Giglio. He's one of the greatest communicators in the history of Christianity. All these campus ministries that you see around the nation now, like at these universities, A&M has a big deal. Uh, Baylor, it started at Baylor when I was there in the late 1980s with Louis Giglio. He had a thing on Monday night called Choice Ministries. And uh, that's, that was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a Bible study for, for college students. And it has since, it has since spread through, th- throughout, throughout the nation. But it started there in Waco. But I heard Louie one night telling his call. Oh, I was thinking, Greg Mott, my dad, meant, or Jimmy mentioned John Bassanio. Greg Mott, who's a pastor of First Houston, he started that at A&M. And they called it, I believe, Breakaway or whatever the name was. That ministry started in Greg Mott's apartment with a handful of guys who were his college buddies. One of them was one of my best friends from high school. He said, John, I was in the apartment when that whole thing started. There were just a few of us there. But it all started with Louis Giglio at Baylor. Louis grew up at the First Baptist Church of Atlanta, Georgia. For all of his life, he sat under the preaching of Charles Stanley. And you know how I feel about him. One of the reasons Louis' ministry has been so solid and so good is because he's, he's so rooted in the Bible and his theology. His whole emphasis is on knowing God. But I heard Louis share how God called him into the ministry there at First Atlanta. He was in college, I believe, late high school, early college when this happened. And one Sunday night at the end of the sermon, Dr. Stanley had finished. The invitation was given. Louis walked down the aisle. He took Dr. Stanley by the hand. He said, Pastor, I believe God is calling me into full-time Christian ministry. Well, Dr. Stanley knew that was a major decision, and in a setting like that, you can't really get, have much of a conversation. That's why we have the family room now. You can at least have a better conversation. And he said, Louie, here's what I want you to do. I'm going to give you a book. I wish I knew what that book was. I can't figure that out. But he said, I'm going to give you a book. And I want you to read this book, and I want you to pray about the call to the ministry, and I want you to think about it. And after you've done all of that, If you still feel like God is calling you into the ministry, one of these Sundays, I want you to walk back down this aisle again. And your next walk down the aisle, that's what we're going to accept as you're surrendering your life. It's too early now. It's premature. This is too big a deal to have a conversation when we can halfway hear each other because of everybody else singing. He sent him back to his seat. Louis read the book. He thought it over. He prayed about it. He knew God was calling him. A few weeks later, he walked back down the aisle. He said, I... That call is on me, and I have to do it. And that was, that was how it was done for him. So calling out the called, that's the title of this message. I thought, God, how do you call them out? Here's what I feel led to do today. I want you to listen very carefully. In just a moment, before we have our salvation call, I'm going to ask, not yet, but I'm going to ask everybody to bow their heads like we always do in prayer. And I and my dad and a few others will be looking around so we can identify you. If you think God may be calling you into the ministry, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Now, I'm not asking you to come to the family room. We're not asking you to register this decision. No, it's too early for that. I'm just asking you to raise your hand. Then, if you raise your hand, here's your next step. I'm going to ask you this week, to call one of the ministers at our church. And one of us, somebody, no one person can meet with everybody, but we'll get you with a minister either this week or next week, do the very best we can with everybody's schedule to get you with a minister. And we have, I think, found a book that we want to give you. And we're going to ask you to read through that book and to meet back with us again. And then after having done that, If you feel God is calling you into the ministry, then we're going to ask you to go to the family room one day and make that, you know, that you register that decision. You make that ultimate surrender at that time. But today, 
Here it is. Is there anybody who says, John, I don't know for sure, but I think God may be calling me into the ministry. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, pray for those sitting next to you and near you to have the courage even to raise their hand. We're going to take 30 seconds. If you say, John, I think God may be calling me in the ministry right now, I'm going to ask you just to raise your hand. This is not a commitment, but it's a willingness. God, John, he may be, and I'm willing. I see two so far. Three. Four. Five. Six. One in the balcony, seven. Not a commitment. You're not signing your life away. You're just saying, you know, John, I'll be honest with you. I need, I need to go down this road. God may be calling me to do something else. And we're going to deal with this in the weeks ahead. But today we're dealing with calling out the call. There's seven so far. Ten more seconds. Anybody else in the balcony? Eight. God bless you. God may be calling me. I don't know if he is or not. I'm not surrendering my life today. I'm making no commitment. Nine. God bless you. God bless. We're just calling out the call. One day, if God is calling you, you'll look back on this service and you'll tell your family and your friends in our church they had a sermon called Calling Out the Called and I thought God may be calling me Father I, I may be off on the count but I think there are nine God help these to know today that they've done the right thing by saying they're willing and I'm asking you in the days and the weeks and the months ahead to clarify this to them in Jesus name in Jesus name now with our heads bowed and eyes closed God doesn't call everybody into the ministry. That's not God's will and God's plan for everybody's life. But it is God's will that everybody be saved. That's why we give this appeal every week. Last week in the second service, 23 people stood up making decisions for Jesus Christ. 23. And in this service today, if you say, John, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I think God is calling me to salvation. I'm like Samuel. I don't, ne I don't yet know the Lord. Well, you can know him now if you'll pray this prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus. Come into my heart, forgive my sins, and make me a Christian. I ask you to save me. I trust you to do it, Jesus. I trust you. Welcome to my heart. Begin now to make me the person that you want me to be. In your name I pray. Amen. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're going to pause for one moment before we end this service. If you just prayed that prayer, or maybe you have prayed that prayer before today, but you've never stood in a setting like this. Now, for this, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And if you'll just stand, I want to acknowledge you. I'm not going to embarrass you, but if you prayed that prayer, one has stood already. Who else would stand in this service? As I said, there were 23 last Sunday in the second service. Who else would stand in this service today? And by standing to say, John, I have I've repented of my sins. I've received Christ by faith. And I'm not ashamed to take my stand for him. Who else would stand? Anybody else in this service today? Anybody else? We're not saved by standing up. We're saved by trusting Jesus. But if our faith is real, we will take our stand. That's one of the ways we know that we're, you know, God does business with those who mean business. Anybody else in this room today need to stand? Well, Father, I thank you for this one who has. Fill his heart with peace is my prayer in Jesus' name. And all the people said, amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord. What an awesome day. Awesome day in God's house. Now, for the nine of you who raised your hand, don't come to the family room today, but call us this week at the church and just say, I need to speak to a minister about maybe going into the ministry, and we'll take it from there.
for the one who stood this morning or others who want to join our church, I would encourage you to go to the family room. I would love to meet you myself, to shake your hand. We want to give you a Bible and welcome you aboard. Also, now, when you go out today at both Welcome Centers, there's the poem in the commons. We still have our booklet out for a few more weeks, Finding a Way Through the Wilderness. So, guys, are you glad you came to church today? Say amen. Are you glad I knocked those three subpoints out? Say amen. <laughs> That's what you're really glad about. Let's stand up. Jimmy's going to get us out of here. Well, let, let's say our purpose statement, our mission statement. Why are we here? This is why, to help all people experience new life in Jesus Christ. Let's sing as we go. His mercy is more.